Another year, another day, and Peckford and Light Railway springs to life. On a balmy summer's morning, Barclay Loco No. 2, Beeston, steams out of Beeston Market Station with the first train of the day, the down early mixed. The milk wagon leads, followed by a couple of coaches. And then two open wagons, destined for Peckforton and Bukeley. Coasting into Beeston Castle and startling a blackbird or two on the way, the sun has already risen, as have a few passengers, intent on travelling to Peckforton or to Bickerton at the furthermost end of the line. Milk churns are awaiting collection on the platform to be exchanged for empties. Meanwhile, back at Beeston Market, diesel mechanical loco number 8 Tolmash has run round its train of empty skips, collected the workman's coach, and is departing for the copper mines. The copper mines at Bukeley and Bickerton have been in production since Roman times. The ore and spoil are transported by the railway and then transshipped to the Chester to Crew mainline at Beeston Market. The mixed has now departed Beeston Castle and is making its way towards Peckforton, alongside and eventually over the River Gowie. At one time this modest stream powered over 20 water mills as it meandered its way down to the River Mersey at Ellesmere Port. Our train passes by the gatehouse for Peckforton Castle. The castle was constructed in the 1840s in medieval Gothic style as a residence for Lord Tolmash and his family. The down ore train passes beneath Back Lane on its approach to Beeston Castle Station. By contrast to Peckforton Castle, Beeston Castle was built in the 1220s by the Earl of Chester. At Peckforton, the resident diesel loco, number 15, Doris, is busily shunting off one of the open wagons from the down mixed and attaching an empty timber wagon from the sawmill sidings. Using the little shunting engine in this way causes the least disruption to passengers who wait patiently on the train while this manoeuvre is carried out. At Bukeley, the other open wagon containing building materials is detached and shunted into one of the sidings. Before the brake van is returned to the rear of the train. By now, the down ore train has caught up with the mixed and so passes on the other loop road. Before taking the junction to the copper mine, the Boneworks building to the rear processes bones and animal byproducts such as manure, offal and skins to produce fertilizer, glue and gelatin. The smells it produces in the process are not particularly popular with local residents. Having completed all its shunting operations and picked up passengers and milk churns from the local dairy farms, the down mixed departs to make its way in typically PLR leisurely fashion down Gallantry Bank to Bickerton. Gallantry Bank is so named because the crossroads at its summit 
were once, reputedly, the site of a gallows tree, where local highwaymen and other brigands were hanged and left dangling as a warning to other would-be miscreants. The gallows tree has long gone, but the name persists. In the meantime, the down ore train has found its way along the branch line to the copper mines. In 1906, a geological survey of the mines was carried out by Spargo and Thomas, who concluded that they would yield around 18,000 tonnes of copper ore, worth £1.1 million, equivalent to around £150 million at today's prices. In reality, these riches were never exploited, but in my imagined history, it's the reason the mines and the railway are still so successful. The mixed has now reached Bickerton where it coasts majestically into the station. Bickerton is actually a very tiny village, but my hypothetical history of the Beckerton Light Railway has decided it became a boom town once the copper mines became so lucrative which is why the railway is needed to serve such a thriving community. Having exchanged its empty skips for loaded ones, the ore train now returns along the branch line to Bukeley to rejoin the main line. Just as the upmixed has climbed Gallantry Bank to make its way into Bukeley Station. With no further shunting operations required along the way, the up mixed makes good time on the return journey to Beeston Market Station. The reason Beeston Market acquired this name is because there is, and until recently was, a large and very active livestock market beside the station at Beeston, just as there was at Welshport. This promotes plenty of traffic on the railway on market days. Hot on its heels comes the ore train, making its way to the interchange siding at the rear of the station. A hidden link to the copper mine allows me to exchange loaded skips for empties, giving the impression that the ore and spoil has been transshipped off stage. In a slightly unusual movement, Black Hawthorne Loco No. 14 Burwardsley reverses up to the brake pan on the rear of the mixed and departs with it to make its way down the line to the sand quarry. Loco No. 2 has now shunted off the milk and timber wagons and retrieved a third coach to depart with the mid-morning down passenger train. The coaches are my version of Leakham Manifold saloons, bashed from Jackson Sharp carriages made by Backman. Their roofs needed to be raised to rescale them to F scale, though they are somewhat shorter in length than the prototypes. However, to my mind, they are in keeping with the original and are extremely reliable runners. Having reached the sand quarry sidings, which are a recent addition to the line, which is why the track is as yet unballasted, Loco No. 14 has attached the brake van to the rear of the train and is now departing up the line with its train of loaded hopper wagons. These are based loosely on those which ran on the Snail Beach and District Railways. Both sandstone and sand were quarried extensively in this part of Cheshire. There was, until relatively recently, a large sand quarry adjacent to Beeston Market. To make operation more interesting, 
I decided to shift its location to the far end of the line near Bickerton. The new extension not only features a runround loop and a siding, it connects with the main line near Peckforton to provide a theoretical link via the gatehouse to Peckforton Castle. Thus, like many other things on my railway, the extension and sidings have a dual identity. The mid-morning down passenger is now on its approach to Beeston Castle Station. My castle is a somewhat scaled down version of the original. I have calculated that to build the crag on which it sits to an accurate scale model would require a structure larger than our house. The passenger train's arrival coincides with the up sand train passing slowly through the station on its way to the interchange sidings at Beeston Market. One of the main reasons I have opted for battery power rather than track power or live steam is to achieve this sort of reliable slow running. I get immense pleasure from watching trains slowly meandering through a garden landscape. And now back to Beeston Market Station. The sand train coasts in on its way to the interchange siding on the right, while the down ore train is waiting patiently for the all clear. Once the line ahead is free, the train of emptied skips makes its way once more down the line to the copper mines. The requirement stipulated by Lord Tolmash that both spoil and ore must be removed provides a potent and plausible reason for regular ore trains up and down the line. As the mid-morning down passenger glides gently into Bickerton Station, we must say au revoir for now.